According to Crime Stoppers, South Australia, in this state alone, about 10% of homicides remain unsolved each year. Although this is a minority, the number builds up. There are now 113 unsolved cases in South Australia, dating back to the 1950s. Although we are constantly advancing our forensic techniques and fine-tuning the investigative process, it is a simple and sad reality that some cases will never see a resolution. However, that won't stop true crime sleuths and law enforcement alike from trying. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two horrifying unsolved cases from Australia. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. If you've tuned in to a cold case detective video in the last year, odds are you've heard us rave about our exciting partnership with Magellan TV. The best source for the hottest and most intriguing true crime content available online. You know about their documentaries and bingeable television shows, and how they go beyond the realm of true crime to deliver unbelievable deep dives into other topics like space or history or the supernatural. In other words, there is always something to watch, no matter where your interests lie. This week we are highlighting the documentary The Crater, a true Vietnam story. A 57 minute picture taking us inside the mind of a former Australian conscript who served in the Vietnam War. The show doesn't simply focus on the terror of war, however, but rather takes us through the hidden darkness that came with digging mass graves for the North Vietnamese soldiers. They do a difficult job of balancing themes of history, horror, and the impact deathly conflict has on mental health, telling an intriguing story while bringing humanity to those who were victims of destruction, regardless of which side they were on. It respects the subjects of tragedy, exactly how we curate our own videos here on Cold Case Detective. The Crater, a true Vietnam story, is also a new release, part of Magellan TV's 15 to 20 hours of brand new content they add to their library each week, always leaving fans of true crime and other relevant topics with something fresh to binge and enjoy. Use the link in the description to access a free month trial and jump into the jaw-dropping adventure of The Crater, a true Vietnam story, and other top-notch documentaries on Magellan TV. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Jessica Small Born in Perth on July 27th of 1982, Jessica Small did not have the easiest upbringing. Described as a clever and bubbly young girl, she had an unstable home life when she hit her teen years. Aged just 15 in 1997, she had already dropped out of high school and was struggling to find work. She also fought frequently with her mother, which led to her moving out of the family home and bouncing between the sofas and spare beds of friends and family. Her best friend, Vanessa Conlon, recalled that Jessica's mother had an issue with alcohol and would often spend the family grocery money on drinks, leaving the house empty of food. In the late evening of October 25th, 1997, Jessica and Vanessa went to the game arcade, Amuse Me, in Bathurst, New South Wales. Here, Jessica had a few alcoholic drinks, which made her a bit tipsy. The arcade was busy, filled with other youngsters, and the friends had fun playing video games, snooker, and dancing to music with other teens their age. Eventually, the girls decided to go and see another friend of theirs, Ben Clark, and hitched a ride with another friend. However, it turned out that Ben wasn't in, so the pair were dropped back in town. From here, the girls ventured to mix takeaway. But since none of their friends were hanging around there, they walked back to the arcade, which was now closed. They then decided to try Ben Clark again, and so walked along William Street towards King's Parade Park before they noticed a car drive past them, turn around, and stop on the opposite side of the street. Neither girl was a stranger to hitchhiking, as it was something they had both done on occasion. They often took turns asking for a lift, and this time it was Vanessa's go. She approached the man in the vehicle, 
which is described as a light-coloured Holden Commodore with an orange blanket on the parcel shelf and holes in the passenger side footwell. The holes are described as being not big enough to put your foot through, but big enough to see the road through. The man asked Vanessa if she had enjoyed the video games and her games of pool, indicating that he had been at the arcade earlier that evening. He then asked her where she and Jessica were going and what they were up to. Both girls got into the vehicle at that point, with Vanessa in the passenger seat and Jessica in the back. They asked for a lift to Hereford Street, where their friend lived, and the man began driving. As they drove down Hereford Street, Vanessa pointed to a spot towards the end of the road. It was brightly lit, and there were several houses there. She asked to be dropped off at that point, and the man said that was fine. However, he stopped short several hundred meters from the well-lit area, in the dark and more isolated part of the road. He then looked back at Jessica and told her to come here. However, Vanessa responded with, I don't think so. The man replied by putting his hand around the 15-year-old's throat and pushing her back into the seat. Jessica took this opportunity to fling the door open, and both she and Vanessa made their attempts to escape, as the man let Vanessa go and tried to grab Jessica. Vanessa recalled that she had to rip her hair from the man's grasp before she was able to run. The two girls ran screaming down the streets, with Jessica behind her best friend. Vanessa said in a later statement, I knew she was behind me because she screamed out first. I heard Jess scream help, but it was a long sound for help. Then I didn't hear anything more, and I kept running. I didn't look back as I ran. She ran to a nearby house and banged on the windows, waking the occupants who quickly called the police. When officers arrived on the scene, they took Vanessa, who had to be calmed down first as she was so hysterical and upset, in their patrol car and drove around looking for the man's vehicle but they were unable to find it. The last sighting of the Holden Commodore is believed to have been near Willett Close in Eglinton. It was traveling in the direction of Hill End. Over the years, investigators have inspected several similar vehicles, but have yet to find the exact one Vanessa described. Authorities believe the last known sighting of the car to be significant because the area is remote and many of the roads at that time were not sealed. They suspected that the driver had local knowledge. However, despite Vanessa's terrifying account and the fact she was visibly shocked and frightened by what happened, Jessica's disappearance was not taken seriously, likely because she was a known runaway who came from a troubled background. They even accused Vanessa of concocting the story to cover up for Jessica, who they believed had taken off of her own volition. It took 10 years before the police force began to actively and earnestly investigate the case, meaning that an entire decade of valuable information and witnesses has likely been lost forever. Plus, the chances of finding Jessica alive have decreased considerably. In 2007 and 2008, a great deal of interesting information came to light. On the night of the disappearance, a woman reported a suspicious vehicle in a secluded area that investigators now believe was likely the Holden Commodore. Additionally, another witness reported seeing a struggle take place in a car around the time of the abduction and heard a woman scream. He then heard, quote, a little bang before the vehicle sped off. The man reported this to the police at the time by phone, but they seemed uninterested in the story and so he went to the police station and told them in person. Officers there took a one-paragraph statement from him. The witness felt he wasn't being taken seriously. Another witness who came forward claimed that their former co-worker had disposed of a Holden Commodore around the same time that Jessica went missing, and a few months after the disappearance, a forest worker outside of Oberon found several notable items and reported them to the police. He discovered a red-stained towel a pair of girls' underwear, a few pieces of girls' clothing, and a bottle of bleach. The authorities collected the items, but never ran any tests on them. They were disposed of in 1998. During the real investigation into the case, beginning in 2007, a young man who'd worked at the arcade in 1997 also came forward. He told law enforcement that he spoke with a man in the arcade who seemed to recognize him. The man seemed very interested in Jessica, watching her and asking the witness questions about her. He reportedly at one point said, who's that? She looks like she's out for a good time. The witness replied, that's Jess. The man is described as being about five foot eight and 34 years of age with a medium build, a bit of a beer belly and dark hair. 
He was wearing a long-sleeved t-shirt, described as being a cowboy-type shirt and a flannel shirt, and there were keys hanging from his jeans. The man mentioned that he worked at the Oberon Timber Mill. The only publicly named suspect in the case that we found was a man named Andrew McBride, who appears to fit the description of the man the witness spoke to in the arcade on the night of October 25th, 1997. McBride claimed that he wasn't in the area on the night of the disappearance, but police disproved this by looking at his bank records. They also discovered that he'd quit his job at the mill and moved from the area shortly after Jessica went missing. He also, according to one report, had a sexual relationship at the time with another 15-year-old, although this was only noted in one of our sources. In 2014, an inquest found that Jessica had been murdered after she was taken, and a year later, authorities offered a $1,000 reward for any information that would lead to an arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. This reward was increased to $1 million in 2018. Jessica Small was last seen on October 25th, 1997, on Hereford Street in Bathurst, New South Wales, running from the driver of a light-colored Holden Commodore. She is described as a white girl with brown shoulder-length hair, blue eyes, and a medium build. She is around five foot six, and on the night of her disappearance was wearing brown shoes, white jeans, and a cream blouse. If you have any information about her disappearance, you can call Crime Stoppers on one 800 Trouble three, trouble zero. Beth Barnard. On the morning of September 23rd, 1986, two men entered the home of a young woman with the intention of making sure she was okay, but they were horrified with what they discovered. 23-year-old Beth Barnard was lying on her bed, her throat cut and a blanket left over her body. The men, who were family members of Beth's lover, fled the scene and reported their findings to the police. Investigators who arrived on the scene shortly afterwards were not prepared for the bloodbath they discovered inside the home, which belonged to Beth's parents and was located on Phillip Island, off Australia's southern coast. At the site, they found cigarette butts and a knife, which was later found to not match the wounds inflicted upon her body. Paper towels stained with blood were around the sink in the bathroom. Beneath the blanket that had been draped over the body, the police found that Beth's nightgown had been pushed up to her neck, and her body had been brutally and violently stabbed and slashed repeatedly. There were strange double cuts on her clothing. Her hands and arms bore defensive wounds, but most chilling of all, a large letter A had been cut into her chest. This detail led to Beth's murder being dubbed the Scarlet Letter Murder, as the carved A is believed to be a reference to the novel of the same name written in 1850 by Nathaniel Hawthorne, in which the main protagonist gives birth to a child she conceived through an affair, and as a result, is forced to wear a scarlet A on her dress. To understand this supposed reference further, however, we must delve into Beth's personal life. Aged 21, Beth met 34-year-old Fergus Cameron, a wealthy farm owner and founding shareholder of the world-renowned Phillip Island Grand Prix. Fergus was married to a woman named Vivian, whom he had met in the 1970s and had moved to the island with shortly afterwards. While Vivian reportedly struggled to fit in, Beth, upon moving to the area, didn't have this issue. She was known to be popular and well-liked, and was never seen as an outsider. The Phillip Island community was small, secretive, and tight-knit, and were often wary of outsiders, but Beth slotted in with the locals easily and had several close friends in the area. Beth was working at Phillip Island's Penguin Parade when she met Fergus, who volunteered there. Four months later, he invited her to work with him and his family as a farmhand. Beth accepted and, unsurprisingly, fit in easy with the Camerons. The children of Fergus's brother Donald referred to her as a sister, and by May of 1985, Beth and Fergus were engaged in an affair. Fergus's frequent absences and long late-night phone calls didn't go unnoticed by Vivian, who had watched as her father left her mother for a younger woman. Fearing the same thing was happening, she attempted to improve the couple's relationship and tried to regain Fergus's interest for the sake of their two young sons, but she could feel him steadily slipping away. By the time of Beth's murder in the autumn of 1986, her affair with one of the island's most wealthy and influential individuals was an open secret. So when the 23-year-old's body turned up with the letter A carved into it, 
Both investigators and the local community had a strong idea of who may have been responsible for the gruesome crime. According to Fergus, on the evening of the 22nd, the night before the murder, his wife finally confronted him about the affair. The couple argued, and Fergus, now 36, admitted that it was true. In response, filled with rage, Vivian smashed a wine glass over his head and back, which cut his ear in the process. She promptly drove her husband to the hospital, where he was treated for his wounds. Medical staff at the hospital reported that the couple didn't seem cool or distant from one another, but seemed together. They did, however, appear somewhat cagey when asked about what happened. While staff suspected a domestic dispute, they were told a story about how Fergus had tripped and fallen through a glass door. Afterwards, Fergus spent the night at his sister Marnie's house. Vivian was last seen dropping him off here at 1 a.m. Fergus told investigators that his wife had called off their marriage and told him that she would return to Melbourne and he could have custody of the children. Vivian's movements that night are unclear, but around 3 a.m. she called her friend Robin and asked her to look after the children, stating that she needed to go to the hospital. In some reports, she states that she had to go to the hospital with her husband, despite the fact that we know for certain the couple went much earlier that evening. The next morning, Vivian had still not returned home, and the couple's car, a Toyota Land Cruiser, was missing. It was Donald who was alerted to this fact first by Robin, who noted that neither Fergus or his wife had come to collect the children, and she had to go to work. Upon hearing this, however, Donald and his family didn't search for Vivian, but instead, Fergus sent him and Marnie's husband, Ian, to check on Beth. When they reported the body to the police, Donald said Beth was not well, rather than that she was dead. Detectives working on the case later reported that they felt Donald had been pretty weird, to quote their words. Senior Constable Alan McFadden said, I've never seen a bunch of people so cool, calm, and collected. You'd think these blokes discovered bodies every day of their lives. Still, nobody was looking for Vivian. Her land cruiser was last seen around 12.30 a.m. by a neighbor outside of Beth's home, and again, at around 5 a.m. near the Sam Remo Bridge. It was discovered here by authorities later that day at 4 p.m., unlocked with the windows down and the keys in the ignition. Inside, detectives found very little blood, which is the opposite of what they expected. They also discovered Vivian's handbag, a hunting knife, and a bloody washcloth. At an inquest two years later, it was found likely that Vivian killed Beth in a personal attack before committing suicide. However, some investigators felt that the key evidence they had didn't fit this theory. Interestingly, a towel in Beth's bathroom had blood stains on it, but they were a match to Vivian rather than the 23-year-old. Vivian's blood was also discovered in her own house, and according to Robin, who came there for the children in the middle of the night, when she arrived at the home, there was no sign of Fergus or Vivian or the shattered wine glass, but her handbag, which was later found in the Land Cruiser, had been left behind. Marnie also reported that when she'd come to look after the children while Vivian drove Fergus to the hospital, the home showed signs of a struggle. There was blood on clothing in the laundry hamper, as well as on the bed in the spare room, a kitchen bench, and on tissues. It was later found to match Vivian's. Furthermore, while DNA of Vivian's was found on the kitchen knife at the scene, it was missing from Beth's body and the area around it. The only other reports of her DNA being at the scene were some cigarette butts and the bloody towel. A teacher turned author named Vicky Petritus, who co-wrote a book about the case, noted that when she was investigating the crime for herself, she found the local community to be fearful or resistant to questioning by an outsider. She reportedly had the door slammed in her face on several occasions and was harassed out of the local newspaper office. After her book was published, one of the biggest bookstores on the island refused to stock it. To some, the behavior of the locals seemed strange and even suspicious, but to others it seems like a small, tight-knit community didn't want to dwell on such a violent and horrific crime. Speaking with Vivian's friends and other island locals, Vicky came to the conclusion that the young woman's suicide was out of character. Many who knew her stated that Vivian would not leave her children behind. Notably, a friend of Vivian's named Glenda Frost claimed that on September 23rd, 1986, at 10 a.m., just hours after the murder occurred, the mother of two called her. Glenda claims that the pair chatted about mundane topics, including sewing patterns. If this is true, 
It means that Vivian did not take her own life immediately following the crime. However, detectives have dismissed Glenda's testimony, stating their belief that she has muddled up her dates. Criminal experts, including former law enforcement officers, have said that they do not believe Vivian faked her death, because there is no evidence whatsoever that she is even dead in the first place. Meanwhile, criminologist Catherine Whiteley, who specializes in women who kill, has publicly stated her disbelief that Vivian was responsible for Beth's death, noting that it is a very, quote, masculine attack. Women who kill often favor more subtle methods, such as poisoning, suffocation, or drowning. But that doesn't mean they are not capable of this level of frenzied violence. Forensic pathologist Dr. Sarah Yule disagrees with Catherine, saying the attack was the work of someone acting out of rage or revenge. She adds, The brutality of it shows the emotionality behind it, which also suggests that they are known to the victim. Former detective Rory O'Connor also commented on the nature of the attack, describing it as vicious and frenzied. Outside of the Cameron family, there are few notable individuals who may be involved with the case. Reportedly, Beth had an admirer who also drove a land cruiser. This person was known to sit outside her house at night and even began cutting her grass when she was out at work. She allegedly argued with this individual and asked them to stop their behavior. Beth told friends that he, quote, got mad at me a few days after this. Additionally, there was a college at the Penguin Parade who had feelings for the 23-year-old that she did not return. However, it is unclear if these two people have been investigated and ruled out at this time. One of Beth's neighbors also made a statement that said a car pulled into her driveway at 7.50 p.m. on the night of the crime and sat there before turning its lights off. It is unknown what became of this lead, but Fergus appears to be in the clear here as he did not finish work until 8 p.m. Other theories in Beth's case are few and far between. Most people believe one of two things, th that the police hold the correct theory, or that Fergus was responsible for the slayings of both Beth and his wife. Allegedly, Beth was going to give Fergus an ultimatum as she was becoming uncomfortable with the affair. It has been suggested that the 36-year-old killed his lover in response to her ultimatum, but that she fought back and injured him, and a messy struggle followed. Afterwards, Fergus cleaned himself up and arranged the crime scene, but had sustained some sort of wound that he explained away by telling Vivian that he had split up with Beth, but she had attacked him in retaliation. The pair went to the hospital together and made up a story about his injuries. During this time, Fergus and his family created a narrative that they planned to tell the police. The following morning, Vivian returned home, which is possibly when she called Glenda, and Fergus later joined her and then killed her. It is likely the police were distracted long enough by Beth's body and the reappearance of the Land Cruiser that they failed to investigate the farm owned by the Camerons right away, giving them time to dispose of Vivian's body. However, this is all speculation at this point in time. According to Victorian police, the case is still open and active. If you have any information about Beth's murder or the disappearance of Vivian Cameron, you can contact Crime Stoppers Victoria on 1-800-333-000. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.